Uh, so today I'm going to try and uh, bring together a few of the previous lectures and uh, discuss a few interactive cases of aortic valve repair and the dilated aorta. And uh, hopefully I'm going to have um, uh, a panel involvement between uh, Dr. Chung, uh, Dr. Vegas and uh, Dr. Schaefer. Uh, so I have no disclosure of conflicts of interest. And uh, we've all uh, seen the panelists here before, and I'll be joined on the panel discussion um, with the, the uh, faculty here. So the outline of my presentation today is I will uh, first very briefly discuss some echocardiographic parameters that are required for aortic valve repair. Um, and then we will go on to discuss uh, between three and five cases um, where we utilized 2D and 3D echo uh, to both direct the surgery and also to help with some clinical decision-making uh, uh, during the surgery. Uh, so uh, the objective of uh, this case, uh, this panel presentation is to really highlight the utility of 3D echo in um, evaluating the aortic valve and to show its uh, superiority over its uh, evaluation with 2D echo. So when we meet a patient for aortic valve repair, what are the things from an echocardiographic point of view that uh, we as echocardiographers need to be taken into account? Well, first of all, we need to assess the severity of the aortic insufficiency. And there are a multitude of ways to assess severity, whether it's beyond 2D with color flow Doppler, looking for hollow diastolic flow reversal, pressure halftime, or 3D echo. And so, Aortic valve repair is mainly for patients with at least moderate, if not moderate to severe aortic insufficiency. Then we need to rule out immediate contraindications to repair. And the immediate contraindications would be a stenotic valve that is generally not amenable to repair. And also valves that are, have acute infective endocarditis that may have significant valvular destruction. Um, and so these are two uh, contraindications to repair. We then need to look at the etiology of the aortic insufficiency. And ECHO can highlight this, uh, whether it's a, a co-optation failure due to dilatation or whether there is an element of prolapse. And oftentimes the direction of the aortic insufficiency jet will highlight this, whether it's a central jet due to mal co or whether it's an eccentric jet due to a prolapse or maybe a leaflet perforation. And it's very important to establish the etiology as this can direct uh, what the surgeon is going to do uh, from a surgical point of view. Next, it's important to highlight the causticity of the valve. And while all valves are amenable to repair, uh, valves with um, you know, bicuspid, unicusp, and a quadcusp valves uh, may be more technically challenging for the surgeons. And it's important to highlight to the surgeon the causticity of the aortic valve that they are going to be dealing with. And then finally, we need to get on to measuring the geometric indices uh, of the aortic valve. And as highlighted in the previous lectures, uh, we know that the aortic valve is a geometrically a very complex apparatus. Uh, it is consisting of um, uh, the aortic cusps and is limited uh, cranially by the ST junction and caudally by the virtual basal ring. And really, 2D echo does not do justice to the uh, measuring the geometric uh, parameters for the aortic valve. And this is where 3D echo is really required to, to make accurate determination of these geometric indices. And when we talk about geometric indices, uh, we've uh, highlighted them in our previous lectures, but we will often uh, measure the, uh, the effective height, the co-optation height, and the geometric length as well as annular um, uh, measurements. And uh, Dr. Schaefer has uh, co-authored a, a excellent review article on how 3D echo is utilized to, to measure all of these geometric indices. So I would advise uh, people afterwards to, um, to read this review article on how the geometric indices are measured with 3D echo. So with that, I'm going to get um, uh, into our first case. And uh, this is a 67-year-old male patient who is having uh, worsening shortness of breath on, an, on exertion. 
Uh, he had a known dilated ascending aorta with at least moderate to severe aortic insufficiency. His ejector fraction was preserved and he had a moderately dilated left ventricle measuring 6.6 .6 centimeters. And the question was to do a, a Bentall versus a valve sparing procedure. Um, so I know, um, uh, having spent time working in uh, Toronto General, that uh, a lot of these procedures are, are done here. So I'm gonna ask uh, the panel is, when you come across a patient like this, what are some of the imaging parameters you perform um, to direct the procedure? And then maybe get the surgical perspective as to how the surgeons interpret these uh, parameters to, uh, to guide the procedure. Uh, so, uh, uh, Dr. Vegas, uh, in terms when you are imaging a patient like this, um, what are the, uh, the protocol you use or how will you go around uh, directing the surgery? Well, first of all, I never direct surgery. That would be <laughs> career suicide at Toronto General. But we do, um, I mean, as you stated earlier, Aiden, I think one of the key principles here is to identify what the mechanism is. So the two... Um, 2D views that you use obviously are the short axis and the long axis, and those will give you information as to whether this is a problem with root geometry or this is a problem with cusps or problem with both. So I think you look at uh, both views and identify what is going to be the most likely uh, pathology here. In terms of dimensions, you would measure your root dimensions as the guidelines suggest, so aortic annulus and systole and the remainder in diastole. Um, we don't specifically, as you know, um, and haven't in the past, been requested to provide any other specific measurements for aortic valve sparing procedures. Recently, we've been doing uh, more quantitative measurements, such as we discussed here of effective height, geometric height, and coaptation length, as well as the, um, the angles. Um, so I think that's, that would be my answer. Uh, very good. Um, so just going to move on with the case. So um, when we performed our echo, uh, we can see here quite a dilated root. Uh, we can see here a, a central jet of aortic insufficiency. And then uh, just as Dr. Vegas uh, mentioned, we went on to make some uh, geometric measurements here. Um, and then uh, also a 3D image showing the, the, the central jet of aortic insufficiency, highlighting that this is more than likely a co-optation uh, defect uh, resulting in this AI. And then looking at some uh, geometric measurements, uh, we will measure um, the aortic valve annulus. Um, we measured the uh, sinotubular junction, which measured 5.4 centimeters, and then also made a measurement of the ascending aorta, which we measured at uh, 5.7 centimeters. Uh, we then looked at uh, the cusps and we could clearly identify uh, in multiplanar reconstruction that there was a significant co-optation defect uh, really involving all of the, the cusps um, leading to this central AI. And then when we interlaid the color flow Doppler into this uh, 3D image, we can see here that all of the AI is coming from this co-optation defect. So, the question now to the surgeons, is there, is there any other information that you would require from us uh, as echocardiographers? And uh, is this enough information for you to, to make a clinical decision as to what might be the best procedure to, to proceed with? Um, uh, Dr. Chung, is there any other information that you would require from us or do you have all the information that uh, you maybe need here? Um, so I, I think that having images without color Doppler is also uh, very important so that you can assess the quality of the leaflets. I think that's, uh, that's key. You don't want uh, calcified, uh, uh, thickened leaflets, uh, I ideally. Ideally, there's uh, as normal as possible. Um, and then all the the measurements um, that uh, Dr. Vegas uh, reviewed very um, um, thoroughly for us, would we, we would also uh, ask for. But Quite, quite clearly this patient is going to have an intraoperative assessment and we can make those measurements uh, as well intraoperatively. And I, I think the procedure that we would all uh, propose would be valve sparing root replacement at uh, first glance here. Very good. Uh, so um, the, the patient did, uh, uh, as you just suggested, went on to have a valve sparing procedure. 
um, also known as the David Procedure, which was um, really um, uh, pioneered uh, at TGH. Um, and so uh, this patient went on to have that procedure and uh, had a very good outcome with uh, trivial aortic insufficiency at the end of the procedure. So uh, moving on to another case, and uh, this case is not too dissimilar, um, except in this instance, it was a 41 year old gentleman. And this instance, he had an acute presentation where he was having chest pain at rest and presented to the, uh, the hospital with, uh, with chest pain of shortness of breath. Um, they were worried about a pulmonary embolism, so they performed a CT angio, and he was found to have a significant uh, ascending aortic root aneurysm. And a bedside TTE that was done at the time showed uh, severe aortic insufficiency, a severely dilated left ventricle, uh, poor LV function, and so he was brought to the operating room for urgent repair. So in the operating room, um, we had a, a massive uh, ascending aortic root aneurysm, a severe aortic insufficiency, and uh, this ascending aorta measured 10 centimeters. Uh, we can see that there's very clearly a co-optation defect uh, leading to this uh, severe central aortic insufficiency. And we can see a, a severely dilated left ventricle uh, with a reduced ejection fraction. So my question to the panel is that uh, this was a, a similar presentation um, and should aortic valve repair or valve sparing procedures always be an option or should we consider patient and surgical factors? Uh, this case was done um, uh, over the weekend. Uh, he was, it was done after midnight. And, and, and so do we think that valve sparing procedures should always be an option or do we need to take into account other factors when making these decisions. Professor Schaefer, if you wanted to chime. Well, no, that's a um, complex question. Uh, number one, I don't think that this case needs to be done after midnight. Uh, I mean, he has severe AR, he has had severe AR for the last weeks and months. Uh, one might even argue, and this is what we sometimes do with these poor left ventricle uh, ventricles to start him on entresto and, uh, and see what happens to the ventricle over time. So we, we actually postpone surgery in some of these patients uh, with intention for four to six weeks. Uh, should it always be an option? Yes. Uh, in my mind, yes, but we need to be realistic. Uh, at this point, uh, valve sparing surgery is not yet a routine procedure uh, that every surgeon is, um, is familiar with, and this patient will not tolerate uh, well um, the need for additional clamping if the cusp repair, concomitant cusp repair will uh, is not uh, adequate, etc. So uh, we should be realistic. I, I would have I would have postponed surgery to make sure it's done at daylight hours during the week uh, when you have uh, more competence available that you can ask for help. And in case of doubt, um, always keep in mind a good replacement is better than a bad repair. Uh, we also need to keep in mind the, the duration of ischemia. Uh, of course, at TGH, he very likely would have undergone a reimplantation procedure. Jen, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, now, this means, and, and um, I'm not a slow surgeon, for me, it means roughly two hours of ischemic time. Um, I can do a remodeling in, an, in one hour and one additional hour of ischemic time will have a certain effect or may have a certain negative effect on the outcome. So we have to be realistic. We need to consider uh, definitely the competence of the surgeon, the experience of the surgeon. And this is where we have to be realistic. Now, uh, that does not mean that every surgeon who repairs aortic valve is automatically a better class surgeon. They simply have a special area of expertise. 
This is like we have surgeons who experience surgeons who are good at uh, at repairing mitral valves and experienced surgeons who simply have difficulty with the 3D imaging and the 3D conceptual work involved. Uh, let's be realistic. The goal is to have an alive patient. I think uh, uh, Dr. Vegas has a has a question as well. Yeah, and if I'm not mistaken, you your patient, the patient you presented, uh, the patient presented with chest pain, um, which is symptomatic. Um, I don't know if there was any prior imaging to suggest what the size of this aneurysm was before. So how do you know it's not, say, acutely dilating? And uh, how would that change uh, the surgeon's perspective of things? Um, so we hadn't, uh, we did not have any prior imaging. Um, uh, so, uh, I mean, we, we were not sure whether this was acutely dilating or whether this was a, a chronic event. Going on his past history, uh, he had been complaining of kind of progressive shortness of breath and uh, uh, chest pain. Uh, so we, we made the assumption that this was a, um, an evolving process over the previous can few I, get, Can I make a comment? Of course. Uh, out of the last few thousand uh, root aneurysms uh, that I've treated, the only ones that had a more acute and, and dynamically evolving process were the ones with subacute or chronic dissection. All the other ones were relatively stable. And the fact that his ventricle was dilated and so poor, in my mind, indicates that this was an end stage uh, uh, of chronic aortic regurgitation rather than acute this uh, regurgitation. Dr. Vegas, would you, would you agree? Obviously there are features that would suggest chronicity, but I guess when we're presented with an acute on chronic event, uh, where the surgeons may push us to say, look, this is you know a surgical emergency. Um, Jen, perhaps you can weigh in. What would your thoughts be on, on timing in this particular case? Um, so, uh, uh, I feel that chest pain, especially, can be quite um, difficult to evaluate. It can be; it could have gone on for a while. It's what's the nature of the chest pain? Is it uh, related? For sure, here we would attribute it to this uh, ten centimeter aneurysm. Uh, when it's such a large aneurysm, uh, I think we all agree that um, there is an urgency to it. So, in this particular scenario, it would be one that's done on this admission. Uh, whether it's uh, one that's done. At midnight, uh, I don't know about that. I think that at, at TGH we would have uh, likely not and done it in the morning. Um, so in terms of, uh, of actually rapidly expanding aneurysms, which is the question, I uh, there are um, can be tricked with uh, limited intimal tears. I have seen that where uh, um, that. Uh, uh, can cause the, the aneurysm to grow very quickly. Um, and then that would be a, an emergency, but that the case that I'm thinking of right now uh, was able to for sure wait until um, daytime uh, hours to do. Um, as, as you know, sometimes uh, our, it's not an, uh, dissimilar to, to thoracos that are symptomatic, right? So we do admit those thoracos and we um, put put them in the CVICU, uh, make sure their um, blood pressure and heart rates uh, well controlled, but we're not gonna do that a symptomatic oracle in, in the middle of the night that's um, asking for poor outcomes. So that one we would wait until morning to do. And so I, I think that would be similar for this case where we would uh, do it first thing in the morning. Very good. Um, okay, we're gonna move on to, uh, so this patient um, uh, went on to have a, a uh, ascending aorta uh, repair and a mechanical aortic valve. Uh, in this case, uh, the surgeon um, uh, was not um, um, used to doing aortic valve repairs. And so he felt that the safest option was to do a, a mechanical valve replacement in this case. So uh, going, moving on to the, ne uh, the next case, uh, we have a 71 year old gentleman uh, who had a good functional status and was investigated for a murmur two years previously and was found to have moderate aortic insufficiency on a TGE. He now presented with worsening shortness of breath and exertion, and the most recent TGE had shown that his aortic insufficiency had now gone to severe 
he had a mildly dilated left ventricle with preserved function. And he was brought to the operating room for aortic valve repair versus replacement. So our first images, we can clearly see that there is a prolapse of one of the aortic valve leaflets. And then when we use color flow Doppler, we can see that there is a very eccentric jet of aortic insufficiency. Uh, the left ventricle is mildly dilated. Uh, however, there is preserved function. Uh, looking at a 3D image, uh, we can see here, there's a lot of redundant tissue on the non-coronary cusp. And when we used our multiplanar reconstruction, uh, when we do this, uh, we tend to use uh, 3D markers to, to mark all our cusps. And we can clearly see that there is prolapse of the, uh, the non-coronary cusp which is resulting in a, a malcoaptation and also a reduced effective height. And then when we interlay our color flow Doppler between uh, in this image, we can see that there is a very eccentric jet of aortic insufficiency. So uh, questions to the panel, um, uh, do, we, do we feel that this aortic valve is repairable? And then um, what other information uh, are we required? And um, uh, so Dr. Schaefer, do you think uh, that this is a good patient for aortic valve repair? Um, I, I think this is a possible patient for aortic valve repair. Uh, you showed us the um, some um, nice 3D uh, reconstruction images. I was not perfectly convinced of the substance of the non-coronary cusp to be absolutely certain that this is okay. Um, Principally at the age of 71, uh, he would also have um, a good prognosis with a biologic valve. So uh, if I was to operate this patient tomorrow, I would plan him for uh, aortic valve repair. I would expect that repair would be possible with a probability of 80%, but there may be findings in the operating room and, and this is where the echo images simply lacked in clarity of, of definition of structure, uh, maybe some surprise in the operating room. And at the age of 71, I would then have a medium low threshold uh, to switch to a replacement. Perfect. And then, so for this case, uh, we went on to, to do some uh, geometric indices uh, to, try and, to try and aid with the decision-making. And, and so for this, we obviously need a, to take a 3D data set. And then in the 3D data set, we will um, measure our aortic valve annulus, uh, which we measured at uh, 2.6 centimeters in this case. Uh, we measured the central coaptation length, um, which was adequate. And then we went on to measure the effective height and the coaptation length between all of the various cusps. And here uh, we find using the 3D markers uh, in cases like this is very good as it takes away the ambiguity of knowing which uh, leaflets you are, you are uh, looking at. Uh, so here in this uh, uh, case or in this image, we can see we measured the uh, effective height and the cooptation length between the, the right and the left coronary cusps and also between the, the non and the left coronary cusps. And then also we changed around our multiplanar planes. So now we were able to measure between the, uh, the right and the non-coronary cusp, as well as the, the non and the left coronary cusp uh, for this uh, patient. And then we went on to measure the, the geometric height of all of the, uh, the non, the left and the right coronary cusps. And so uh, for this case, uh, all of the indices, all the geometric indices uh, suggested that um, uh, this patient may be amenable to repair um, and that the surgeon would make his decision um, when he did a visual inspection. Um, however, the question that I would like to ask the panel is, um, in terms of performing an annuloplasty, when do we, uh, when do, you, when do you consider doing an annuloplasty? And uh, the difference between a, a suture versus a ring annuloplasty for these cases. Jen, you want to comment first? Uh, no, please go ahead. Okay, maybe one comment first before I answer your question. Um, we speak of the length of a football field 
and the height of CN Tower. Why do we call it co-optation length when we mean co-optation height? Um, I had this discussion with Alain Bereby, who the summer in Rome, who finally agreed that he would reword and speak of co-optation height. In addition, I find it very difficult to measure co-optation height precisely. It's always two, two millimeters more or less because the lower part of this co-optation zone is very difficult to determine. Um, how much geometric height did you have? And the annulus, you went through the images so quickly. Can you- oh, I'm sorry. That? I apologize. So the annulus was measured at uh, 2.6 centimeters and uh, the geometric height was, uh, I think, over nine millimeters. Geometric height over nine? No. No, sorry. Um, it should be 20 or somewhat less. I, I don't have the precise numbers here. Um, it looks I, to, I, I mean, just visually, it looks to me like partial prolapse of distal prolapse of, of the non-coronary cusp. And the others look, again, visually normal. So I would expect an echo geometric height of maybe 18 millimeters, which in the operating room will be 20 or 21. Um, probably an annuloplasty is advisable beyond 24, 25 millimeters, even though in our retrospective analysis, we have not yet found that annuloplasty in an isolated tricuspid repair has been um, the game changer. So if we have an adequate geometric height, and actually you did not state the numbers, uh, I didn't miss them, um, repair, yes. Um, I personally feel comfortable with the suture annuloplasty. Maybe Jen uh, can make a comment. How about ring? Um, so, um, yeah, we, we can cut the bottom end off of a Dacron and to do the ring, we don't have the, um, the commercially available one. Um, and uh, we also do actually have the suture annuloplasty and I have used it when the muscle does come up too high on the on the and it's and the dissection is too precarious for for um, um, but that's for for valve sparings. Um, so in this case, I, I would do an annuloplasty because uh, I think that uh, 26 um, is uh, is not normal, you know. So nor we're trying to bring this patient back to what we consider um, <laughs> a, a more typical um, a, a geometry, and so I think that if it was uh, 24 or more, we would uh, try and at least stabilize it. And I don't think the method is as important as as uh, doing it. Very good. Um, so this patient uh, um, underwent a annuloplasty and he, uh, on uh, the surgeon visually inspected uh, the valve and he confirmed that there was prolapse of the non-coronary cusp and he underwent a plication of the non-coronary cusp uh, in this case. Uh, and so uh, post, uh, post bypass, um, the patient had uh, trace aortic insufficiency and um, good co-optation uh, between all the leaflets. Um, so I think we are just coming up to, to 11. Uh, so we'll finish with, uh, with this case. Um, and if there's any other questions uh, from the audience or the panel, uh, I would encourage uh, people to ask uh, questions. Uh, there are a couple of audience questions. I, I feel like uh, um, we, we, I think sort of one person deleted it, but they wanted to know the, the vendor that you're using for the, um, T E E uh, 3D reconstructions. Oh, uh, so that is a, a, a GE, and uh, a GE and TomTech um, allow you to place markers within your within your 3D image. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, it's quite useful for, uh, especially for aortic valves. Uh, it's quite useful for for uh, for performing NPRs. I noticed that you you snuck in a heart ring just at the end of the sessions, <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, another audience uh, question. Uh, if this is for Dr. Schaefer, so which is, uh, what are what are you looking for on TEE that will convince you to reclamp and re repair? Oh, another simple question with a complex answer. Um, I definitely look at uh, jet size. I definitely look at jet eccentricity. Uh, I also look at the patient. Um, 
um, a 50 year old patient requires better um, repair uh, to bring him to the rest of his life than a 75 year old. Uh, so if there was an eccentric jet of more than grade one, or if there was billowing, and this is something that we discussed before, billowing of more than two to three millimeters, I would reclamp and uh, try to uh, improve the repair. Okay, um, thank you very much, um, Azad. Azad is in the break already, mentally? Uh, no, 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 she, he's, he's... Sorry, <laughs> headphone problems. Ed, so, Dr. Jaffer, that was in the absence of any AI, if there's billowing, and if the measurements of durability are not what you would prefer, you would still go back and redo the repair in that situation? Yes, 10 years ago, I would have accepted that. Now, uh, I have... Um, a few uh, a few patients that that developed early failure, probably uh, related to excessive stress on this billowing cusp. And if I have five five four to five millimeters of billowing, I will go back. Now the question key question is uh, how much billowing is billowing, and there you have to be careful. Uh, a two D mid esophageal view may give you projection artifacts. So. Uh, what we always do is 3D and uh, we double check by a deep transgastric view to make sure we don't have a projection artifact, but indeed billowing. Hmm. Yeah, so the, the measurements that we've been traditionally trying to uh, look at is that as a coaptation height, which we unfortunately measure in two length mostly, which obviously should be done ideally in, in three length uh, in 3D. And the coaptation height took from the annulus to the tip, but as you say, that's the uh, ventricular side of that is point is quite difficult to identify. Wait a second. From annulus to tips is effective height. Coaptation yes. height is you, because you just said coaptation height from annulus to tips. Yes. Uh, annulus to tips is relatively easy, even though even though you may be. Um, uh, in mistaken, you you may run into projection artifacts if you determine the annular plane just by 2D. So you you have to make certain that you determine the annular plane right, and this you can best do by 3D uh, multiplanar reconstruction. And then effective height is very easy to measure, plus minus one millimeter. That's the error of margin. Cooptation height. Uh, you know, for a cooptation height of three to four millimeters, you have an error of margin of maybe two millimeters, which I think makes this less uh, dependable. The question of cooptation height, uh, again, goes back to the Brussels publication, the, the one I took the table from that I showed in my presentation. Um, and uh, ever since, it has remained in the discussion, even though we have never seen an independent effect of cooptation height on the durability of the repair. So this is why I'm a little, I always, I'm always skeptical. If I cannot reproduce a question, a problem or whatever, uh, I, I try to question whether this is really relevant or we can forget about it. I'm not as provocative as saying, forget about cooptation height. Uh, all I'm trying to say is be a little skeptical because it's very difficult to measure precisely. And I'm not, I don't, I don't know any surgeon who would go back in and reclamp just because cooptation height is a millimeter or two below the recommended um, um, error, um, range. Okay, so the two key variables are billowing and the effective height. Yes. The two, the two primary measures. D Dr. Vegas. So Dr. Schaefer, you know, as a reference surgeon with years of experience, you're pretty uh, flexible to go back on pump and aim for, I guess, in many respects, perfection. Um, what about, you know, patients where uh, the post-pump echo is showing, say, um, that type of finding. 
Um, is it up to the echocardiographer, you think, or the surgeon to sort of decide whether it's reasonable to go back on pump? Who would Good you put question. the weight on here? At, at the end of the day, the surgeon, of course, has to decide, number one. Um, now, I do my own TEEs. I'm not so good with 3D, but give me any patient with a 2D TEE and I can do a, a full assessment myself. But in that, I'm not representative of uh, the average surgeon. So the, the uh, echocardiographer must give the surgeon some guidance and maybe one correction or, or modification. It's not about going back on pump. The hardest test phase for any repaired aortic valve is the first three to five minutes of reperfusion. When you're, when you're on the pump, you're cannulated, you're stable, um, and, and you usually see more AI in that phase than you will see 10, 15 minutes later when you come off pump. If in that phase you, you see something, it's not about clamp, it's not about cannulating, going back on pump and so forth. It's all about uh, reclamping and giving cardioplegia. So in, to come back with these considerations, I think the um, echocardiographer should give the surgeon the adequate, clear and adequate information. Uh, at the end of the day, the, the way uh, responsibilities are distributed, it will be up to the surgeon whether he listens to you or whether he goes his own way. So, uh, Professor Shapers, uh, the geometry looks good on echo. You're happy with your effective height. You're happy with the, the billowing minimal. Um, there's mild central AI. I will very likely leave it. I will very likely accept it because th this is like in mitral repair. If we completely eliminate prolapse and there is mild residual leak because of a fold somewhere, the prognosis of that repaired mitral valve is very good. You know, even if you have a 10 to 20% chance of having to reoperate within 10 years, that's not a whole lot. So for the aortic valve, it's very similar. We haven't done the systematic study, but simply going back, uh, simply looking at my experience, I've had very few aortic valves with perfect form, mild AI, that I had to reoperate within 10, 15 years. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful session. Thank you very much, Dr. Chang and Dr. Gregory, Dr. Vegas, and Professor Schaefer for a wonderful discussion and excellent lectures. Uh, we're running a little bit late, so we'll take a shorter 10-minute break, and we'll return at 11.20 uh, for the next session.